Hello everyone, welcome to my show. My name is Manav Tucker and I'm here with Nikki Glotzman, aka Kesari. <laughs> how are you today, Kesari? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. How would you like me to refer to you as Nikki or Kesari? What do you prefer? Uh, dude, it's so weird. I don't know, I've never been called Kesari. It's just okay. like what I use for all my music, but I think that's fine. Shoot, people weird. are starting to get to know you as Kesari. Yeah, people are calling me Kesari now. That's really weird because like, I don't respond to it. I'm still not used to it. I'm like, okay, but. Yeah. And how has uh, it been for you lately with this whole pandemic? It spanned over a year now mm -hmm. since the first case. Um, I would say for me personally, COVID was actually like a silver lining in a lot of ways because I was in my last year of uni when the outbreak happened. I was in New York and I was writing a lot of music, but then I started really producing music when the pandemic hit because we had a lot more time inside. Right. I was recording like every day versus like every week before. like. Um, and so it was just like a lot more productive and even now too like i'm in the studio my home studio like every day recording music and so i really enjoy it wow. my mom's not stressing me out about getting a job which is really nice <laughs> yeah um and just being able to like stay creative i think it's, i don't know i'm very blessed and to have like supportive friends and parents to help me through all of it as well that is that is really awesome yeah. i know how i can get with parents because it's their job right they want you to be safe yeah, they, especially they asian, parents, asian parents like once you get into like art or like you're not going to be a doctor you're not going to be a banker <laughs> you're going to do like marketing or music or like art they're just like I don't know. but hey before nikki came into the house i offered her to wear her shoes or slippers to come inside <laughs> and she said she wouldn't like she's good cultured We've asian, been asian girl been trained. <laughs> <laughs> i like that i like to see that and um how how are your friends? Have you been able to keep in touch with them? Have you been going out with them? Um, not so much going out because of COVID. I think right, right now we all just like meet up in a house. We're like, hey, what's good? Like, let's go here. Or let's like switch apartments and where we hang out. Um, I keep in touch with a lot of my friends in New York, but it's more so like a once a month call kind of thing with like close friends to just catch up for an hour or two. Mm -hmm. um, but in Thailand now, I'm just with all my like high school friends, which is really nice. Or people I've known since I was ten. Yeah. So it's nice for me because before. I, like when I was off to uni, like I'd never had friends for more than like four or five years, just like always bouncing around different schools. And I lived in Hong Kong for 13 years and like changed schools every two or three years. So it was right. nice to come back to a solid friend group. I think it definitely helped make me more confident in my music and releasing it. Well, definitely, is, yeah. definitely. People you've known for longer, uh, there's just a certain comfort level that you have. With yeah, them. and it's just like you don't mind like sharing your art. I. It's weird in New York. I was never comfortable with like sharing music or like singing in front of my friends. Whereas here in Thailand, like that's what I'm known for in my friend group. And now my friends are learning how to play instruments and stuff. Yeah. So it's just like a much more like safer environment for sure. Very cool. Yeah. And did your friends have anything to do with your artist name? No, not my friends. My mom actually chose it. So my Thai name is Tam. Macomb. And so I was like, that's not a very sexy, like, artist, like, music kind of name. So I was like, oh, Kuma, like, if you were to give me an actual Thai name, what would it be? She said Kesari. So I was like, okay, I really like that. Because, you know, Nikki Glexman is a very white, very Jewish name. Mm -hmm. And I'm neither white nor Jewish. So I was like, this is going to be a bit of an issue. Um, yeah. So that's how Kesari came. Very cool. Out. And what's the meaning of Kesari? I mean, well, what did you ask her why Kesari, or did you just <laughs> agree with it? It's like, yep, yeah, that's the one. I think it was just it was the first name she came up with, and mm. it really rang with me. I shared it with my manager in New York at the time, and she really liked it too. And we were like starting to plan already, like all the different graphics you could do with it, because I do all my own graphics and most of my like cover art. Very we were, cool. Like, this just fits really well, and it's like a one name, and there's like no one on Instagram has this name, no one on Facebook has this name either, mm -hmm. and so we were like, it's cool because no one in the industry already has a name like Kesari. They have like a Nikki already. They probably have like a bunch of other like having a singular name. I think is very hard to come by, mm -hmm. and so we're like, this is cool. It always off to come well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Kesari also also means saffron in Hindi. And look, the lion as well. And lion? Yeah. And lion as well. I googled well, it too. <laughs> she's googled it. Just to make sure. <laughs> just to make sure. I was like, it's not offensive. It's not like, I don't even know. Because my mom just like picked it randomly. Yeah. Very cool though. Very cool that you do your own graphics and stuff. When did you get interested in doing that? Um, I was always into graphics just um, since I was a kid. Like I was always doing art, music, and dance. Those were like my three. Mm -hmm. I never did acting. That was like probably my like one I didn't touch, but art, okay. like I did IV art, so I did a lot of like sculpting, and then when I went to uni, I needed to know how to do graphic design just for like when I would intern at management companies, marketing companies, like for tour posters and stuff like that, so right. I have um, like 
Photoshop and then use my iPad and draw and sketch designs. So, cool. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Thank you. And I know the first time that we met was at Foodland Tonggal. Yes. Foodland <laughs> After a great it's night stable. out. <laughs> What would you? But when we met, you mentioned that usually at this time, I think it was we met in November. November? Yeah. yeah, November. Uh, you said at about this time or in December, you fly out to the U.S. Mm -hmm. to visit your family for yeah. Christmas and and all of that. So how has that been uh, spending that time here in Bangkok without your family mm -hmm. in the states? I mean, if anything, I think it offers a new perspective for me because the last four years I was in the states with my American family like I would see them quite often and so to be back here for Christmas and we just went like a week and a half long trip with me and my mom her sister and then all of the cousins mm -hmm. and so I think that was really nice because you know I typically spend Christmas with my American family um, and they go all out with Christmas but here it was more like chill like we just went to the beach and had a nice fun time like a very Thai Christmas which I appreciated and I missed because I know when I'm in the U.S. for Christmas it's bloody cold as hell yeah and it's like snowing I don't I can do snow for like three days and mm -hmm. I'm like okay I'm out I can spend a month at the beach and it'll be fine you mm -hmm. know um, and it wasn't like dead hot it was actually it was so amazing nice. it was so nice <laughs> it was sunny it wasn't raining it wasn't like too hot and so I don't know it was just great like it was great. and like all that stuff I went to Phuket as well, I think yeah. a little bit before you went mm -hmm. and I had a great time, amazing weather. I just wanted to stay there. I was like, I'm just going to stay here for yeah. a couple months, you know? Like, I would be bro. down. I think a lot of people are doing that now too. I realize like all my friends that are doing online school, they're just like, oh, let's go to Khao Yai, let's go to Phuket. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. for a month, I'm like, yo, I'm really tempted now. It sucks that like a lot of my friends have full-time jobs that mm -hmm. they go to the office for. They're not like uni students anymore, but mm -hmm. maybe we'll see yeah. before rainy season comes back. Yep. Absolutely. So my next question is, what inspired you to be an artist? It's weird because I think I always kind of knew I wanted to do music. Um, growing up with like quite, my parents aren't strict, but they're very traditional in a sense. My mom's like very Thai mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, Thai Chinese. And so the stigma with doing arts has never been a career pursuit. It's always like one of those like extracurricular pursuit type things. And so that really hindered me from like, going out performing my songs and all that stuff instead I would just like perform in the choir or like do talent shows at school mm -hmm. um but when I went to New York I was kind of exposed to like all these people who were doing music as a career and I realized how yeah. envious I was of them and so when I went and studied abroad in London for six months I just had this like surge of muse and everywhere we were traveling to I was like oh I want to write yeah. about this I want to write a song about this about this and so I came back to New York for my last year of school, I started working with producers and that's when I kind of told my mom, especially when like COVID was starting to become more relevant, I was like, this is kind of what I want to do and what I want to try and spend doing after school. Like if I can have like a year or two of like you just being supportive of me, then that would be amazing because then I could fully focus on my craft and not have to focus on almost like teasing you in a way. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it came about. Like it was always in me, but I think just like the settings I was in really helped push me to pursue it full time. Right. So there was no particular person or song that kind of made you feel like, wow, I want to write something like that, or wow, I want to be a, be a performer like that. Oh, there definitely are like influences. I think my youngest, like the first one I had was Billy Joel. I don't know if you wow, know. yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. But he was like my biggest role model growing up, like all the songs he wrote, because he tells a story. And I think I look at artists and look up to them in different ways. So Billy Joel's like his songwriting is amazing. His like composition is crazy. Like mm -hmm. I just want to be like him <laughs> in so many different ways. Um, Ariana Grande, like her vocals. Oh my God. So when I look up to you, like I just watched her, I think it's like, excuse me, I love you, like video on mm -hmm. Netflix and I cried. <laughs> I was like, your voice is so like beautiful and amazing. Like that's something I look up to. It's on Netflix. Yeah, it's on Netflix. I gotta watch that. Yeah. And then Jeremy Zucker, I think, and Chelsea Cutler, just because of the way they write their music and produce it, go about producing it, like very minimalistic style, which I really look up to as well. So very just cool. like, I think it was a combination of like growing up with certain people and then finding other sounds that I related to and I wanted to recreate mm -hmm. um, were definitely how I approached getting into music. Nice. Yeah. It's awesome. So Billy Joel, is that it? That's number one? Mm -hmm. Wow. Billy okay. Joel, yeah. <laughs> I saw him live too, and I cried. Wow. There's a video of me like crying in Madison Square Garden. <laughs> you watched him at Madison Square Garden? Yeah, it was so, wow. it was for a class actually. So my professor 
ha- does like the partnerships for him, like brand partnerships for him. So we were able to go watch his show. Because um, wow. he does like a monthly one at Madison Square Garden. So it was really, really cool. So cool. Yeah. That must have been such a great experience. Damn. So I've, I've yet to see a concert at Madison Square Garden. Oh, I recommend it. I yeah. You can definitely get like cheap tickets there too. People I think are under the impression like big names only go to Madison Square Garden, but even big names, like we get nosebleed seats, you can just pay like 40 bucks and it's great. You know, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I'm like a concert junkie, so I'll go like whenever I have a chance. Oh, like, same. Same. Other than Billy Joel, mm-hmm. what kind of music do you listen to? Uh... I listen to a lot of, I guess, it's like lo-fi pop, I guess, or like, like I don't know how to call it, but it's like Lainey, Jerry mm-hmm. Zucker, Chelsea mm-hmm. Cutler, Dominic Fike. So it's like pop, but more urban almost, or like softer pop, I don't know, like indie pop kind of stuff. Like what you would listen to in your, in your bedroom mm-hmm. instead of like listening it, to it out at a party kind of thing. Right. Um, I think that for me is most calming music to listen to and the music I usually relate to most because like it's what you listen to when you're like eating breakfast or what you listen to around the house versus like what you're listening to when you're drinking at a party mm-hmm. um so yeah like that kind of cool stuff. and that's what I'm trying to like switch into now as well I like, see that I see that with instead and, and phony yeah your two other singles that you have with there's some people on on that um song with you too right mm-hmm. like ER ERL yeah Earl Earl yeah. Earl and um, Alex the Great. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about those two. So I actually met, so they're both named Alex, actually. So it got very confusing very quickly for like whenever <laughs> I would try to explain it with someone. But Earl, um, I met him through my friend Nicole. Um, we were interning together at the same company. And she was like, oh, this guy needs like a top line. Like, would you be able to work with him? Would you be down? And I was like, yeah, for sure. And then we met up and clicked really quickly. I sent him my music and then he sent me a demo like the next day. And it was for instead. At that time, it was called Alone Together. And then we just kept working on it. COVID hit, so it set us back a few months. And then we just kept grinding. I re-recorded all the vocals actually here in my house because we were like, oh, the ones that we took in New York, we wanted to like redo them. Mm-hmm. And so it was made both here and in New York. And then we released it. Um, and then he went to school with Alex the Great. Mm. Um, so we reached out to him as well. We were like, Do you, would you want to rap on this song? Um, here's what it sounds like as of now. And then we got him on the track. He was really easy to work with as well. Mm-hmm. I FaceTimed him. We just had a quick session, recorded everything, and then we released it a month later. Well, so Alex the Great is the rapper. Mm-hmm. And Earl is the producer? Yes. Very cool. So, I, yeah, if I'm not wrong, um, Phony was a song that was more like chill hop yeah. rap and stuff, yeah. right? And then instead it was more like chill EDM mm-hmm. type kind of was a little hype too though. I kinda The drop. Yeah, the drop was the drop was definitely hype. Thank you. But um it was a very good listen. Your voice is amazing. Thank you so much. And speaking about your amazing voice, I'd like to move on to um, a t- 2020 Christmas. Ah uh, yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> that was one we did very spontaneously, me and my friend Dee. Mm-hmm. Um I was in Phuket actually, and I was like, yo, like this Christmas is gonna be so unique compared to any other Christmas. I wanna write about it and what's different this year from last year. Yeah. And I think the common theme we we found with a lot of our friends is everyone's in long term relationships or they were in long term relationships and so they were doing long distance a lot, or they were like seeing someone and then they were like they moved somewhere else and so the relationship aspect of things during Christmas was very ambiguous for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So we were trying to write about that, then about how like some things in Christmas will always stay the same, like being with your family, like being able to enjoy, like having one another and that kind of stuff. Like yeah. trying to make a positive spin on a crap year. Yeah. yeah. There was someone, there, there were some other aspects of her life involved in the song too, right? Like yeah. you, you were missing someone, sort of. Not really. No. <laughs> I mean, I definitely miss all my friends in New York. Uh, so you could say basically. Yeah. Basically, it's all my friends. In New you're York. missing. You're missing people from back home. Yes. So would you mind um, singing a little bit of the song for us? If twenty twenty Christmas. Yeah. yeah. Just the chorus. What will Christmas look yeah. like? this twenty twenty. Um. Right. What will Christmas look like? It's twenty twenty. Seems like we got plenty of things to do that we didn't get to. On our New Year's resolutions Cause things got crazy so fast That I haven't thought about this past year mm-hmm. But now we're here mm-hmm. in December Oh, what do you remember? Sitting by the fireplace 
<laughs> sitting by the fireplace. It was funny because when I was writing that part, I was like, I'm near no fireplace. I'm on a <laughs> beach. Like, yeah. it's fucking hot. Oh, it's hot, very hot. Um, <laughs> but the production and your sound and, and the way the way it all, all sounded together was amazing. Your your voice and the production was was really, really well made. Thank you. Yeah, my friend Dean, he's honestly crazy. He's the one who was also working on my next song. He produced my um, my upcoming single as well. But yeah. um, he, I was just like, I want it super minimalistic. I hear these elements to it. I can hear a fireplace roasting. I can hear bells. And we just like made it together in mm-hmm. one month. And usually if you work on a song, it takes at least, in my experience, two or three months. And so the fact that we got it finished in one month, we did all the marketing in yep. the like two weeks it was on the, the distributor before it got posted on Spotify. We were just like running around like crazy, but we both wanted to have like one more song out before the end of the year. Very cool. And what genre would you say your song falls in? That one's definitely pop. I would say like pop holiday, but then it does have some R&B twist to it. Like R&B is definitely one of the genres I really enjoy creating based off as well because mm-hmm. I think there's just so much there there's so much you can work with with R&B and it's always so like emotional true which is why I really enjoy it very true so for your latest single Blonde Eyes Blue Hair what was the inspiration behind the creation of this mm-hmm. um so it initially started as like telling a story of two international kids mm-hmm. two TCKs third, cu- third culture kids like moving to New York and just exploring life there together like mm-hmm. that's how it started and that was like the story I was trying to tell but then when I started describing the features of this guy that I was seeing I decided to flip it and just say instead of blonde hair blue eyes make it blonde eyes blue hair and I initially did that because I thought people wouldn't notice the change it was subtle enough like you didn't even notice it when we were talking about it earlier (laughs) but I think that was like my whole point I was trying to make too of like how in the entertainment industry and just I feel like the common perception of beauty standards is a guy with like blonde hair and they have like bright blue eyes but how now with I think representation growing and diversity like it's becoming less and less relevant and that's the whole point and that's what I really try to convey in the cover art and with uh, the music video as well like the main the Mm -hmm. supporting actor is also Asian Mm -hmm. and I think it just goes to show like nowadays like it doesn't matter like what color your skin is what you look like what you're trying to be and it's like trying to be more inclusive and remind people that like people like us should be able to be on TV and should be able to be represented, not in like a stereotypical way. Like Mm -hmm. someone who's Thai or someone who's Chinese shouldn't just always be like the best friend, like who's a studious smart girl. Like someone who's mixed shouldn't just be the hot prop in the corner. Like an Indian guy shouldn't be the guy running a store. Like I'm sorry, like they should be main characters as well. And like, I see it happening more on some Netflix shows, but then I also see like, movies still being created and TV shows with an all white cast. And it Mm -hmm. just bothers me so much. I'm like, hello, like there's so much more Mm -hmm. and there's so many more stories to tell. I think we've already told enough stories from the Western perspective or like the white perspective. And Mm -hmm. I feel like, especially in Asia, like, I mean, we're from here, we're from Thailand, we're both Asian. Like there's so much that we experience that the world doesn't know about Mm -hmm. yet. And I don't know if they want to hear it, but I feel like we're, getting to the direction of people being more open-minded to hear our stories and what we have to say. Yeah. Which I'm excited about. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I did read something about it, the, the concept, like the whole look of the single being derived from an anime type. Yeah. Oh, yeah can you tell me movie. more about that? Um, so I always, I grew up watching anime like Hamtaro, Naruto, like Pokemon, all that stuff like mm-hmm. was stuff I enjoyed watching as a kid. Yeah. Um, and I think with that too, like the anime look, I've definitely seen some anime characters with like purple or blue hair. So I was like, oh, that definitely yeah. fits. Like if we make it like an anime dream world kind of thing. So <laughs> the concept behind the music video is like, there's three scenes, right? So the party scene is New York City. It's supposed to be right. New York City. So the video, it was really cool because it was, we have shots of New York City, which my friend, um, took Mark and he's great and it was directed in LA but then everything all the scenes you see were shot in in Bangkok Mm -hmm. and so we wanted to create this kind of ambiguous feeling of like oh we think it's in New York but we know she's from Bangkok Mm -hmm. and obviously she's there right now so how did this kind of work thing like we wanted to make it very confusing Mm because I feel like just with anyone who's mixed or anyone who's a third culture kid we are just confusing so I was like oh this is like it's just gonna roll with it yeah Um, but 
So the house party scene is like us in New York, like establishing a connection. But then when you see the blue backgrounds or the red backgrounds, it's us in this like dream world kind of state, right, which is what right. you see in like a lot of anime. And like we did like the colored contacts, which is very popular as well in Asian culture. And so we got mm. like I got like these gray contacts that made my eyes expand like 30 percent. Like, I was like, look like a bug. It was crazy. I mean, give him blonde contacts. Which I think is a lot more common just in like any anime. Like people have cool colored eyes or yeah, funky hair. For sure. Um, and then there was just yeah, a couple scenes of us just exploring Bangkok. We went yeah. to a cool art show, we went to a restaurant. Um mm -hmm. yeah. very cool. You know, like I I really like the concept of the music video that way because anime is so beautiful, like so visually appealing to watch, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times when I've been studying or something on, or doing something I have like a chill hop open on the side and mm -hmm. this anime like animation of this person on their desk and then looking outside mm -hmm. everything just looks so so beautiful yeah I'm sure like I'm sure everyone's gonna really enjoy this music video I hope so very visually appealing but yeah I don't know anime in general is just so cool like you and that's also too like something that's becoming more and more globally accepted which is what I, what I love seeing like anime in terms of like film stuff and k-pop in terms of music like mm -hmm. Western people are listening and watching these things now, which yeah. is what I really enjoy. And I just want to see that kind of like expand, you know, like mm -hmm. I had a friend, I bought like these haiku stickers. I don't know if you guys watch haiku. It's like a volleyball anime. It's really oh, good. okay. Um, but like I had like three friends of mine in New York messaging me being like, oh, this show is so good. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I had no clue. I was like, I would have never expected like these friends of mine in New York to like watch these shows now. And I guess yeah. quarantine opened up a lot of that. Definitely yeah. opened up. <laughs> quarantine, I feel like people were so bored. Like I've watched everything on Netflix. I've watched everything on Apple TV, YouTube. All right, now yeah. I'm going to go into anime. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me more about um, the people involved in the creation of this music video? Mm -hmm. I know you're one of your really good friends from back, uh, from back in high school was mm -hmm. actually the one who directed the yeah, music video. Yeah, she's the director and the editor. So my friend yep. Maddie Bull, she is a USC film grad. Um, she was the director and the editor for the music video. She also came up with a lot of the concepts with me. So when we were brainstorming back in like October, we would come up with like the ideas we want, the kind of plot line we wanted. So for each line of the song, we we're like, oh, what kind of scenes do we want here? Mm -hmm. um, and then Delray was the next person we really got in touch with, who was the DP for the music video. And I met him through a friend I met quarantining when I got back to Bangkok. So we like, oh, wow. we were both like on the way to the hospital, get, go get tested. I was like, yo, what's good? And then we ended up being really great friends. Um, <laughs> what a cool story. Wow. Very small world. Um, Radhika, hi, love you. Um, and yeah, after that, he got me, he got the team together for his team. So the assistant camera people, so mm -hmm. Wine and Saga. And then I reached out to this guy named Sun Sun, who is our producer as well. And he was really great. He has a lot of experience in filmmaking and he had, he went to school in the U.S. and Florida for a bit as well. And he was a mutual friend. Everyone I kind of worked with, they were all under 30. Mm -hmm. They're all like friends of friends. Yep. Um, I was initially going to do the music video with a full on production company, but it was just too expensive. And I thought like you lose a lot of the creative control when you get involved with a big company like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we were charging something mad, like 4,000, 600,000 baht. I was like, <laughs> I pay for all this myself. I am a poor, like broke college student. My mother is not helping me with any of this. Like, I was like, this is way out of budget. I kept asking like, can you lower it? And then it just didn't make sense. So I was like, I'd rather yeah. do it with like my close friend, who I trust with my life. Mm -hmm. And she like, even every time I talk to her, I'm like, oh, can we change this, this, and this? And then she'll go beyond my expectations every time. So I, like, just trust Maddie with everything. Oh, she was awesome. I, I mean, I, I was able to talk to her, too, when I was there. And she, she was in complete control, and she was giving so much Over energy. Zoom. <laughs> she was like, over Zoom. She was giving us so much energy over Zoom, you know? Actually appreciating all the effort that was going into everything and all of us listening to her. And she has a really interesting story, too, because for her, she, I think, only lived in the U.S. for two years, but then okay. she lived in, like, Saudi, she lived in China, she lived in Thailand. And so for her as well, she's very much a TCK, and she, like, bounced around from these different places. So when I sent her the song, she really related to it. And when I explained the storyline and the meaning behind the song, she was on board, like, super quick, just because for her, she was like, I understand. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I guess, the one thing I'm worried about is people who didn't grow up in this very obviously unique community being able to understand like how different it is from, I guess, like growing up in a small town in the U.S. or absolutely like, a small city in I mean, Europe. We are all pretty much third cultured kids. Yeah. So. 
It's, I love it. I love it. It's it's one of the most amazing things I've noticed uh, in my own personality and in people that have grown up here, like mm-hmm. third culture kids, is that they can talk to anyone yeah. in any way. And it just seems like you're on the same you're on the same level, wavelength, like same yeah. wavelength. Exactly. It's like home is not home is not where like a physical place. Home is where your friends and your family are. Mm-hmm. And that's something I really learned to like kind of get used to. So like in New York, like I have a home there because mm-hmm. I have my friends from uni there. Like in Europe, I have a home there because I have family there. In Thailand, I have family here. Mm-hmm. And so being able, I think it lets us be more adventurous with where we want to go, where we want to travel, where we want to be, because for us, we connect with people. We don't connect with like physical places. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, if we're at liberty, liberty to speak about this, mm-hmm. how is your relationship with uh, the main, the other main oh, PK? actor in PK? Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. So me and PK met. We met. Oh my god, so long ago. We met in twenty twelve for the first time. Um, and so we met just through a mutual friend Ed, and we stayed good friends. Um, all throughout like high school and we talked a little bit during uni but he mm-hmm. went to NIST so um one of my rival high schools that my cousin went to <laughs> they're in the same year yeah he was also really into acting and dancing and so that's how we got on and when I went to uni I knew he was in New York for a bit as well he finished up school there as well mm-hmm. and so when I came back to Thailand I knew he had acting experience and he was probably the only one I knew in Thailand who had any sort of acting experience I was like yo do you want to meet up and Mm. talk I have like this cool idea for a music video I was wondering if you'd be interested in it and yeah we got lunch and just talked through the whole idea and he was on board it was really great um and he was super like nice with like working like we were working out schedules and stuff he was busy because he had an art show going on as well he's a photographer too he's a photographer too yeah yeah so I I noticed that too with a lot of arts kids too we never just do one art form it's like you do music and you do art and you do dance or you do photography and film and you do acting like it's all Absolutely. intertwined, which I think is really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. I love it. There's always just so much to do, right? Yeah. But um, what kind of acting experience did PK have? Um, so he was on The Face Thailand. So I think that's like modeling and acting. I know he's been in a few movies, I think. I've seen a few okay. like small art projects that he's been involved in too, just from um, his art gallery. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it was really cool work. And I know this year he's really planning on like going to a lot of auditions and making the shift, I guess, from more modeling to acting. I think he's been doing that for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and he also like works with like one of my friends, his clothing brand and stuff. I think it's just like we're doing little, every artist right now, I feel like he's doing like small projects to like stay busy and kind of like spread themselves out a bit. Yeah. Um, which is like probably my favorite part of the industry is not just focusing on one thing. True. Very true. And I think PK fit the image that you were trying yeah. to get really, really well. Like, he did it really, really well. I think it's going to be jarring for a lot of people, too, because the song is going to come out, and then the next week, the music video is going to be out, and people are going to expect it to be a white guy. I bet yeah. you now people are going to expect the song to have a white guy mm-hmm. as the main character, because even the drawing, too, it's, like, kind of ambiguous because it's an anime character. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. So you, had, you have already identified yourself as an artist who likes to tell a story with their songs. Mm-hmm. In which situations do you find yourself, do you find yourself having the energy to write? Um, I would say there's definitely a lot of different settings, like breakups are obviously like a big one if you're feeling sad or like you just want to let out some steam. Um, another one I I find myself drawing a lot of music from is just like my friends and the people around me. Like if mm-hmm. someone's having a bad day or someone's having a great day, what I do sometimes I know it's like not the best, but I imagine how they were feeling and put myself in their shoes. Mm-hmm. Even when we're having a conversation, I try to feel what they're feeling. And so for me, especially if a story sticks, mm-hmm. I'll write a story based on that. Um, and so I think that's like the main ways that I write. Or if I'm feeling happy, if I'm around like a new environment, like when I was around Europe, like I think the place I wrote the most was Iceland. Cause I'd never been in an environment like that before. I was with like four friends and we were just like backpacking around, like driving around, like crashing in like random spots in the country and yeah you know you're around beaches you're around mountains you're around glaciers and so yeah. that like whole setting just like offered a lot of like muse for me to just like draw from for sure absolutely i remember hearing that in your um introduction video on youtube yeah. she made a whole <laughs> whole introduction video on youtube explaining herself the pretty much whole process, whole process of yeah. how she got here and started the youtube channel and you know it was a really great great interview and you went to how many places in Europe with your notebook that your friend gave you uh, I think it's 12 
12 well, places yeah. in Europe. Because I collected little like flags from everywhere I went. Wow. So I put them in my backpack. Yeah, it was really cool. What were really some cool. of the places that you went to? Um, like five. Name top five. Okay, so Iceland's definitely number one. We okay. saw the Northern Lights and I cried like a little oh bitch. Oh my god! I've so always cute. wanted to see it. Because um, we it. all had we had our like Canon cameras, right? We did a long term exposure because we, like, we kind of see the white lights. Like let's like just take a camera and we boom. It was like green on the screen and purples oh. and blues. And we're like, oh my god, this is crazy. Picture it. Um, <laughs> Dublin, Ireland was probably number two because that's where I spent my twenty first birthday. My birthday is the day after St Patrick's Day, so uh, my twenty first. You know, we had a lot of fun rolling into my birthday just because it was everyone was drinking mm -hmm. um, in Dublin. Um, another cool one was probably Malta. I don't know if you guys have heard of Malta, but it's just it's cool because there's just like a bunch of different cultures in one place. What kind and of cultures? It, there's like African culture, there's Spanish culture, there's like I think even Asian, some Asian culture in it as well. And so it's like a very eclectic place to be if that makes sense mm -hmm. um yeah so it was really cool just kind of see and it, it reminded me of like people like us i'm like oh wow. there's some asian influence over there there's some african influence over there <laughs> oh really cool like just like in one like town square like yeah. you can see it in the architecture and like the clothing very cool um that was um, spain you went to spain too right yeah oh we went to Barcelona, it was great, and then we went to Ibiza, and it was off-season. So no one was there, not even the McDonald's was open, it was a really big L. And so not we, even the McDonald's? Not even the McDonald's was open. So we found, like, I think we found, like, a Burger King or something, we just played cards in Ibiza on a Saturday night, oh just, like, God. playing cards, and we were just like, all right, this is cool. Yeah. Um, so Spain was interesting, for sure. And then, oh, Italy, 100%, Italy. south of Italy, like, Naples, and then you go down to Amalfi, and Positano, like, mm. the all the, like, I guess like ocean island kind mm -hmm. of places that was really cool and just like being around really great people like great food yeah best seafood pasta I've ever had seafood pizza like mm -hmm. oh. um make sweden was really cool we went to the abba museum um sweden sweden, like, sweden well. was really cold though so i'm sure like <laughs> you go up north you're like oh, fuck. um but yeah that's it. That's probably my top five. Sorry, that's awesome. So you went to all these places in 2019? Yeah. So I How was... lucky is that, though? I know the timing. How lucky is that? You went to all these places <laughs> right before you couldn't travel anymore. It was interesting because a lot of my friends, my uni mates, they would always... We would always study abroad in the spring, I guess. Like, that was usually when people went. Some people yeah. went in the fall, but most people went in the spring. Spring so or summer. Mine was, like, the last big year. Because then right after, my friends who went abroad in spring 2020, mm -hmm. obviously, they were there for, like, a month. And then they had to go back. And it sucked. And, like, that sucks. I had some friends who went They went to NYU Shanghai for the semester. And then they got kicked out of NYU Shanghai. So they went to Tel Aviv. And then they went to Florence. And then they got kicked out. Wow. Anyway, so it was just like bouncing between <laughs> different places trying to figure out, oh, where's the like least likely place the COVID's gonna be? Yeah. Um, Damn. Very fortunate and very like blessed too, I think, with the timing of everything as well. Like, yeah. I graduated, I think, at the right time. Even though it sucked, I didn't have like the last three months of school. Mm -hmm. um, it just felt like the right time for me to graduate and just make music, you know? Definitely. De I agree with that. Because that was my plan after coming back too, yeah. but then I obviously had to get a job to get the funds. Did you plan to come back to Bangkok? Though? Yeah. Oh, okay. For me, it was I more did. so like I was planning on staying in the States for okay. a while. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of people were giving me so much sympathy. They were like, oh man, you didn't get your graduation? That sucks. Yeah. I'm just like, I got almost my whole four years of yeah. proper college experience and it's never going to be the same. Mm -hmm. Everyone who's still in school, it's never gonna be the same. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like I feel really for people like my sister. She finished. She only had four months of uni before COVID. Oh wow! And so she didn't even have her first year. I feel like your first year is when you're meeting all these people. You're like yeah. adjusting the classes. You're getting used to the city. And for her, it's like she's gonna have to go back. She's taking a year off now, but she's gonna have to go back and restart. I think it's that. smart. I think it's smart to take a year off. Right yeah, now. Oh, definitely smart. Hundred percent. Because tuition is more expensive, and you don't get to meet your professors, and you don't get to go all, all the networking events and stuff. It's yeah. Just okay. Yeah. That's our two cents. <laughs> <laughs> so my next question yes. is gonna be your rise to stardom, your rise to fame with TikTok. Hi, the also great but controversial platform. <laughs> <laughs> How did you come about using TikTok for the first time? Um, so I got TikTok 
right when like the COVID pandemic hit. I feel like everyone and their brother and their mom and their family, <laughs> yeah. like downloaded TikTok in like mid March. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just making funny dance videos with my friends. Like okay. we were stuck in New York in an apartment together with like my close friend, mm -hmm. and we just make dance videos. But when I came back to Thailand, I stopped using it because I was like, oh, like English TikToks. I don't know if they're really gonna pick up. Mm -hmm. um, but one day I was locked out of my aunt's house with my sister. We were just like waiting outside <laughs> to be let in. And I was like, yo, what if we do like a half news problem, fun how the and then so we're just <laughs> sitting out there. I didn't even write anything in Thai and I was just like complaining about like things happy people experience and then yeah. that just blew up. And then I just continued posting videos about like mixed kids and the problems we experience. Like I think the one that's the funniest for me at least is like when people think that my mom is the Mebaan. <laughs> And I'm just like, Ooh. but when my mom's Ooh. the helper kind of thing. And then, um, or like when people are like, oh, you're from Thailand? Oh, you speak Taiwanese? That's so cool. Taiwanese. Like, <laughs> the amount of times I got that in New York, I'm like, okay, cool. Bye. Like, Bro, in America, the first time I told someone I'm from Thailand, yeah. they're like, you don't look Thai. I'm like, are you, are you serious right now? Like, yeah. oh, I, I, I'm Indian. I'm Indian. But I was born in Thailand. I grew up in Thailand. It's like when they say to people who are like Asian, lived in America their whole life, and they're like, "Oh, I'm from California." You're like, but you don't look Californian. And I'm like, oh, why is it? Why is it like that? In America, everyone thought I was like Brazilian or Argentinian or like Mexican, and so they would speak to me in Spanish <laughs> instead of. And I was like, well, I can't speak. Like, if I would go to a bar and someone just start talking to me, a lot of people speak Spanish in New York, so they start speaking to me in Spanish. I'm like, I can respond in Chinese like Mandarin or yeah. Thai or English, but I don't know it. Yeah. Or whatever. I feel like it is a stereotype that Americans or America, people in America are not very um, educated about geography, yeah. or it was a stereotype, but having gone there and experienced it, I see where it comes from. Mm -hmm. but obviously there's, there are so many people who are educated about it, yeah. but like the general population of people that I met there. We're not very educated because America is huge, yeah. right? They don't really have to leave the country to go a lot of places. Yeah, that's definitely true. A lot of people didn't even have passports. Like people going to uni, well off, they just don't have passports. Yeah, a lot of my friends don't have passports, and it's just because yeah. they instead of you know going to another country, they could go somewhere else in the states. Like there's so many cool places to visit. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, but I did notice too, like because my family now lives in uh, in Virginia, so like going in the south, that was definitely like a big eye opener for me in terms of just like the sort of racial segregation that's still in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and people like obviously thought I was Hispanic, mm -hmm. and when I would say, "Oh no, I'm Asian," it like didn't help. You know, like people <laughs> would still be like, "Ah, so you're still not white?" You know, <laughs> you know? and I was just like, "Wow, like there's wow. still so much room definitely in the U.S. to grow, mm -hmm. but it's definitely a great place to be." Maybe not. Yeah. I think it's super cool how you coined the phrase happy problem <laughs> and made that your niche on TikTok. Yeah. What was the first TikTok of happy problems that blew up? It Do you was, remember? It was the one where I was locked out. It was my you were locked out. We were just, I think it was like, oh, did your mom bait your dad? Like, um, when people are like, oh, your English is so good. Like, <laughs> oh why was your English so good? Like, I'm like, sorry. It was like, I don't know. You grew up speaking it. You know what I mean? Like, Every time I would go to the U.S., I'd say I'm from Thailand. They're like, "Oh, well, how do you know how to speak English?" Speak English. Every Uber driver ever. Every Uber driver ever. Or they're like, "Oh, you don't have an accent. That's so cool." I'm like, yeah. "No shit, no shit. <laughs> I don't have an accent. Like, what do you want me to say?" Oh yeah, cool. Thanks for observing that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, that was like the first one, and then I just continued doing that, and I started doing like just Thai things as well. Mm -hmm. So like things just Thai things, things. just <laughs> Thai things, happy problems. Um, and so with that too, I started also writing it in Thai, okay. and that was I think honestly my introduction to learning Thai because I grew up speaking and learning Mandarin. Right. Um, living in Hong Kong, like I didn't take Thai lessons at all. Mm -hmm. So I moved back um, in June, mm -hmm. started taking Thai lessons, and so I can write really well in Thai now, and I'm starting to get more comfortable with speaking. Very nice. Um, I think that's definitely like a mixed kid or like just third culture kid thing too of like we all speak English really well mm -hmm. but then our mother tongue because we grew up in like either going to international school you're always around people who speak English like our mother tongue slowly slowly gets worse and worse I don't know about for you but my Thai like went downhill like when I went to uni my Mandarin it's just like fading slowly <laughs> so my family speaks a different dialect my family speaks Gujarati mm -hmm. but um, Hindi is obviously the main language mm -hmm. and being Indian and not being completely fluent in Hindi mm -hmm. definitely affected my character. Mm -hmm. So when I went to uni, um, I actually took Hindi one, two, and three. Oh, really? Expert level Hindi. I learned how to read, write, and That's speak cool. fluent. I could speak okay, mm -hmm. but now I'm completely fluent and I can read and write. I, can, I couldn't mm -hmm. even read 
a single letter before. Yeah. Can read it right now. That's so interesting because my family, it's the same. They speak another dialect. They speak like Hokkien, which is what they speak in Taiwan and mm-hmm. like southern, western China. Yeah. But I was the only one who spoke Mandarin. So my way of communicating with my family, especially like my grandparents, was through writing because we write the same, but then we'd speak completely different. And it helps so much learning your mother tongue, right? Yeah. Like, it helps so much with your character. You're like, oh, I'm finally me. Like, you know, yeah. I can be completely me. And That's how I feel, feel with Thai too because like I. Like, my family is Thai Chinese, but we never lived in China. Like, we lived mm-hmm. in Hong Kong, but it's obviously different. There's mm-hmm. a lot of British influence, but starting to learn Thai, like, all the little phrases, all the little, like, short, like, catchphrases people say, and, like, the slang, I think it's really nice because you feel more at home the more and more you kind of learn about your home culture. Because mm-hmm. I guess we're, we're used to learning about all different cultures that we don't spend a lot of time on just, like, Thai culture. Yeah. At least. Yeah. One of my favorite TikToks that you have is... Uh, the, what was it? The happy problems talking about food. You know when you ask a foreigner what their favorite food in <laughs> Thailand is? I love Pad Thai! I love Pad Thai. Oh my god, Pad Thai. That one, you're like, oh my yeah, god. Yeah, I love Pad Thai. Pad thai. Yeah, like when you, they find out you're from Thailand, it's like, ah, oh, Pad Thai is so good. And you know Pad Thai, I don't even think it's a Thai dish. It was like a Western <laughs> dish that came back. I was like doing research on it. I was like, bro, I don't know. Because like, we would eat Pad Thai, obviously, but it was not like ever a main like yeah. main thing and then yeah. you like go to the states and it's like pad thai pad thai pad thai yeah. i love thai food let's go get pad thai and <laughs> pad i'm like thai. there's so much more to it and that was like one thing that was definitely sad too i was fortunate in new york to have good thai places but it was not the same mm-hmm. and if you go to like i don't know i would go visit family in like virginia or connecticut thai food would be so bad bro i swear there's not a there's not one decent place in the states that i've gone to that has a good kapow but kapow then guy. everyone in thai, in the u.s they're always like oh my favorite food is thai food I find that interesting. I'm like, mm. like when you put bell peppers or corn or broccoli in the curry I'm like, what the <laughs> hell is this? This? This, this is rude. This is, yeah. I'm offended. <laughs> what were some of the other foods that you listed? Like, kabao kai. Mubing. Mubing. Oh, mubing is the best. Mubing is so good. Um, kai pot. I don't know. What else? Oh, som tam. Som tam. Yeah, no one knows som tam in the US and it makes me so sad because that's probably my favorite Thai dish. Oh, yeah. Like, what we'd always eat. Som tam with sticky rice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Gankyoan, like all the curries and stuff. I feel like in mm. the US, everyone always knows like Indian curries, but they don't know Thai curries or they think Thai curries are the same as like Indian curries. Mm. So, yeah. Definitely interesting. I had a question about your Instagram and your, but your Instagram handle is Kesari with a underscore. underscore. Yeah. So why the underscore? Was Kesari already taken? It's been taken by this guy who has like three followers. And I've been trying to get the handle for so long, but he just won't respond to any of my messages. Um, so yeah, that's why it's the Kesari. Guy who has the Kesari handle. Can I please get the handle? Please. Thank you so much. All right. Um, but yeah, it's the same with like Instagram too, or TikTok as well. I think there's one person with just like Kesari Twitter as well. So I was just like, okay, with the underscore, it makes it easier rather than trying to put a last name on it. Because mm-hmm. my music's obviously just like Kesari. There's no like last name. Yeah. Are there any... Um, Talking about your um, music now, which will probably be in the, will be further down. But talking about your music, is there any particular instrument um, that helps you get into the groove of things, mm-hmm. get into the groove of writing? Because I know, like, when I go close to my piano and I'm just playing some keys, and some some words just come up in my head, and I start singing and making a melody out of it, and get goosebumps all over. Yeah. Like, wow, that was something. Is there a particular instrument that gives you that feeling? For me, it's always been piano. Like I've always played like the keys since I was six, or seven, maybe even younger, like four or five. Wow. Um, but I started learning guitar too when I was seven, and so I play that as well. But in uni, I didn't have a guitar. Like my guitar broke my third year, mm-hmm. and so um, it was too broke to buy a new one. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm just gonna like get back into the keys and stuff. And so that's definitely my main instrument but mm-hmm. I've been trying to learn like more guitar so you can like record with it I think it's cool like recording like actual guitar versus like the MIDI keyboard yeah stuff um and yeah very cool last thing is your surprise that I told you about <laughs> we've got so some, cool uh, <laughs> we've got some custom merch for you oh my god there's a moxie too I love moxie shirts we got both styles for you <laughs> One of them Thank you. is the exact same as what I'm wearing, mm. but it's got a custom Yo, it's so sick. jersey name at the back. I love the back. Yeah, like CEO of Happy Problems. <laughs> CEO of Happy Problems. Thank have to so have much. that up there. We'll yeah. definitely add um, blonde eyes, blue hair yeah, at the back when it comes out. Oh my gosh, this is 
so cool. Shout out to What? Go for it. Go for it. Whichever one you want. Just undress it. <laughs> I love like baggy shirts, anyways. Mm -hmm. That's like my go to. Like when we were in uni, mm. I would always roll up in a long sleeve and sweatpants. Yeah. I was never one of those like New York socialites who would go in like heels and everything. I was like in my Uggs, mm -hmm. and like rolling up, like what's good. Yeah. yeah. Better to feel good. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you so much for being on the show. Thank this was amazing. It's yeah. such a pleasure having you and talking to you and learning so much about you. I think you are honestly a great person as a person, just a great person from what I can tell. Very level-headed knowing that you have to do everything on your own and find people that can help you out. You know, it's not like let's blow money on this and that. It's like, no, it's like I want my talent to speak. And I'm gonna get people to help me yeah. raise that voice. And, and I think there's a lot of people to here too who are just like supportive and like they're nice. They want to work with you too. Like when we met at Foodland, I was just like, yeah. oh yeah, you do music too. Like that's so sick. Like I think in Thailand specifically too, like everyone's just down to work with one another. It doesn't matter like yeah. if you have like ten thousand followers or a hundred thousand followers or like two hundred. Like no one cares. And I think that's really refreshing. And it's a very unique sort of environment. To Definitely, you can only get that at home, right? Yeah. Thank yeah. you for having me. Of course. Yeah, we have. What do you have? <laughs>